practical, legal, moral statement. God says the wages of sin is death. We all die for our sins. We all die because we are rebels against God. We can gain new life because of Jesus Christ. But we are rebels against God. And to rebel against God, the punishment for that is death. And so they thought these people should be, should be execu executed. This was their understanding of sacred justice. But Saul, who has the divine right of punishment, also has the divine right of grace. Also has the divine right of, being for, of forgiving. And that is also part of his anointing from the Spirit. And that also adds to our understanding of what the Messiah is going to be. It is only the power of God that can forgive sin. You remember when Jesus went in, into various homes and says, I forgive you your sins. They were all going, no, 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 no. Only God can do that. And they were right. Only God can forgive sins. Only the, God's anointed has the right to pardon in this way. This little paragraph illustrates and starts a whole line of understanding and reasoning about who the Messiah was going to be. You know, a lot of our reasoning starts with funny little pictures of Jesus in the, in the cradle. You know, and so we see in the movies, you know, we pray to baby Jesus, or, or you know, we just like that little guy in, in the manger because he he's, can't hurt us very much. Their understanding of who the Messiah was going to be one of the great places where it, it's promoted is in this chapter. The anointed one, whom God has confirmed through victory, is the only one who has the ability to forgive crimes, who can abolish the demands of divine justice. This is his job. This is his right. The Messiah enforces God's commands, but he also gives us forgiveness. We find here in First and Second Samuel, and we'll see more of it as we go along as we understand God's bringing a king into their lives and how kings were supposed to function. A great deal about what a Messiah would look like. A great deal about their messianic expectations, about the anointed one. Messiah means anointed one, and the kings were anointed by oil and by the Holy Spirit. This chapter tells us a great deal about the Messiah providing us with salvation. It's a very important chapter in our understanding of what the Messiah would do in our life. In particular, it says that this individual is confirmed first by the Spirit of God. You know, you see God, God's Spirit coming on Saul here, and then he gets angry, and then he calls the people to battle. In the New Testament, when we have Jesus Christ, the first thing that happens in his public ministry is that he is anointed by the Spirit. The Spirit descends upon him. The first thing that we need to know as we go out into this new year is that the Spirit of God has to live in us before we can do anything. Then it is confirmed by military victory over the enemies. And finally, by the power uh, to change uh, divine justice into divine mercy. But it starts with the Spirit of God. And we need to know that this is, is also applied to Jesus Christ, our Savior. This is the way the Messiah first appeared when Israel first started thinking about someone who would come and save them, not only from their physical enemies, but from their spiritual enemies and from their sin. This chapter's emphasis on military deliverance is at the core of its contribution to, to Israel's understanding of the Messiah. And we also need to know that our Messiah will one day not just come into our hearts, not just be born in a, in a manger, but he will ride into town at the head of an army, and everyone on this earth will know that Jesus Christ is king. It's not just something spiritual. It is also something very real and something very material. This text opens up with deliverance from the Ammonites. And here for the first time, we see the anointed one who is a means of salvation, a means of deliverance. And we need to know that God can deliver us from all of our enemies, whether they are physical or whether they are spiritual. Whether he does so, that's another question. He has lots of things going on. And sometimes he would rather have you be strong than have you be healthy. Strong mentally, strong spiritually, strong emotionally than what your body is doing. God wants you to know 
that he is the means of salvation. But your body is only one part of that. Saul was moved by God's spirit. This is Saul's shining moment. He didn't have another one. <laughs> this was it for him. He was moved by God, he obeyed God, and he went with this. Saul hears about the Ammonite threat. He is touched by the Spirit of God. He's moved into action by God's initiative into his life. And then, in God's timing, he does something. This is how God moves in our life. If you see a need this year, if you see something that is wrong this year, God may be moving in your life to do something about that. God brings to you all the troubles in this world and wants you to respond to him, wants you to respond to that problem in this world, whether it is a global ecological meltdown or whether it is your next door neighbor who needs their lawn mowed, whether it is something spiritual, whether it's something physical, you will see things this year and you need to respond to them with the spirit of God. But when God's servants uh, try to, to work in his power without relying on his power, when they try to do those good things out there without relying on the Spirit, they will end up doing horrible damage. The results of anything that we try to do without God's Spirit living in us are mixed at best. But when God prods us, when we are working in the power of the Spirit, those results that we will see are going to be effective. They may not be the ones you want to see, but you need to know that God has promised that his word will not return void, that his spirit will always get the job done, whether we see it or not. We need to be open to the spirit's leading. We have all experienced times of failure when we have re, re, lived with doing things in our own power. We need to know that we have to do things in God's power. We may have been attempting to do something worthy or, or, or tremendous, but we cannot rely on our own skills and talents. Now, it's not always easy to know when God is moving you. Now, the Spirit, there are a couple things I want to say about this. The Spirit will never contradict the Word. If you think that the Lord is calling you to rob a bank so that you can give money to the church so that we can, oh, I don't know, repair the windows, uh, or, you know, send people to, to China to, to minister, that's not right. The Spirit will never contradict the Word. But sometimes it is more difficult to figure out whether the Spirit is leading us. And there's a couple of tricks that I'd like you to, to you might want to apply. And I, they're not biblical, but I think that they're fairly sound. The one is um, the two-witness rule. If you have two different people who have no connection to, to each other come and tell you to do something, or ask you to do something, or point out a need to you, you need to li listen very carefully to see whether or not that's the Word of God. You know, if two people get together and they conspire against you and say, oh, we think you ought to do this, you know, that's not necessarily, you know, Spirit of God speaking. But if two separate people who have no connection tell you to do something, you, may, you need to really listen to see whether that's the Spirit of God. Another thing that you can think about is, are you doing it against your natural instincts? Your natural instinct may be to confront people. Well, if, you're, if the Spirit of God is leading you to back off, and your natural instinct is to confront, you probably want to listen to those things that go against your natural instincts. If your natural instinct is to withdraw from people and not to confront, and God says to confront, then you probably should listen to that, to the Holy Spirit talking in your life. You know, it's not always easy. And sometimes good and godly people will tell you things, and you just have to say no. The Apostle Paul did this. A prophet from God who spoke from God said, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be in prison. And Paul said, I have to go anyway. You know, yeah, I am going to be in prison, but I'm going to go anyway. God doesn't necessarily promise us good things. I want to close with a story about John Wesley uh, and his life. You may not know these guys. John and his brother Charles, probably there's probably ten hymns in our hymnal that these guys wrote. And they are also responsible for all